Anyone who's watched more than a few Deep Sky videos will by now be familiar with Nick Semenek, who is one of the best astrophotographers in the business. And we're really lucky to have him involved in helping us out. Now a lot of you have left comments and sent emails asking for more information about Nick, and in particular, the equipment he uses. You've also asked if he's got any advice for people who are starting out. We've made a few videos about this, and the one you're about to watch is the first of those. This is the back garden observatory, as you see here, a 10 foot diameter fiberglass dome. I've had the observatory here for about 20 years now, 20 years this year in fact, so um, it's been fantastic for keeping the equipment safe and ready to observe as soon as the night sky is clear. Pear Tree Observatory came from the fact that the only place I could actually site the dome in the garden was where there was a, a quite established pear tree. So it had to go, unfortunately. I sort of felt quite bad about that, but it was the only place in the garden that had the good south viewpoint. You don't spend all night out here, do you? Well, I used to spend many hours out here, even in the winter, dress up warm and just sit with the equipment. But some years back, I decided that, that you know there's not much fun in doing that. So the plan was to have a, a wireless in, an internet link between the observatory and the study upstairs. So I come out here and fire everything up. And then once that's done, I go inside to the room upstairs and the control room is there. How good's what you've got now? Um, it's very good. Um, it's uh, an imaging setup I'm really pleased with and I'll probably keep for the foreseeable future because I can't think of many ways to actually improve the setup as it is. All right. Do you want me to? Yeah, I'll that? give you the camera. Yeah. You got it? Yeah. If we sort of break this down into its individual components, from here to here, is the equatorial mound, the equipment that actually tracks the motion of the sky. If you think about it, we're on a planet that's actually rotating once a day, once every 24 hours. Now from our vantage point, what that means is everything we see in the sky is moving across the sky at quite a significant rate. You don't really notice it in the daytime by looking at the moon in the sky. But if you look through a powerful telescope, you can see that motion really clearly, it's very fast. Most of the targets we're interested in photographing are incredibly faint. So we have to take very long exposures. So what you have to do with a mount like this, it has to be um, very carefully aligned on a point in the sky called the North Celestial Pole, which is just an extension of the Earth's rotational axis. And it's marked very conveniently by the star Polaris. This axis of the mount is pointing straight up to the North Celestial Pole. And when you've done that properly, it's called polar alignment. Once that's done, the telescope will track the motion of the sky with just one motion. Even with very high quality mounts like this, it is also necessary to do something called auto guiding as well. This is the main imaging camera with the cables coming out here and the one sticking this little sort of black like an eyepiece is actually the auto guiding camera. Now what's happening is that whilst the CCD imaging camera is taking the picture through the main telescope, this uh, auto guiding camera is also looking through the telescope but just at a small reference star and that's taking exposures every five or six seconds and if it sees any deviation of that guide star from a particular pixel location it sends a command to the mount to do a corrective move. The telescope itself is a 10 inch Ritchie Crescent telescope. The light comes in through this open tube, is collected by the mirror, it bounces back up to the second hyperbolic mirror just inside there. The light then goes back down the tube again through a hole in the primary mirror out to all the instrumentation on the back. Then here is an electronic focuser. The mirror itself is fixed in place. So to, to focus the camera, you have to have a mechanism, i.e. the electronic focuser, that can literally move the camera backwards and forwards. Then we have the filter wheel. This circular housing here has a rotating carousel inside with multiple filters. Although the camera's a black and white camera, we take images through multiple filters to combine to produce a colour image. So we have to have a mechanism for moving these different filters into the field of view of the camera. One last thing I feel like we haven't explained is the Pentax thing on the top. Sure, yeah, there's the small scope on the top. I've had this a long time now. I've got a lot of affection for this telescope. It's a, what we call a three-inch refractor. The field of view of this one compared to that is much wider. Things like, for example, the Andromeda Galaxy just wouldn't fit on the chip in its entirety with the main telescope. So if I wanted to image comets or things like that, or wide field targets, things like the North American Nebula, I could just take the camera off and switch to this one. 
The telescope and the mount are linked to what we call planetarium software, as you can see on the screen. This is a representation of what's actually in the sky at the moment. The crosshairs show you where the telescope's actually pointing at the moment. So if we wanted to move onto a particular target, like the bright star Capella here, I just click on that. It brings up a little dialog box telling me information about this star Capella. And then it's a simple case of clicking on this button here, and then off the telescope goes. It's almost disappointingly easy. No, no it isn't. It's very happily pleasing. Uh, there's no disappointment at, when your telescope points at a target first time and every time. It's a really good thing. For the people starting out, take heart because you don't need this level of equipment to, to get good results. And we also wouldn't recommend that you just went out and bought this equipment because there is a fairly steep learning curve. But once you get to this stage, the learning curve just goes flat because you're just doing the same thing every night. We'd recommend starting with a short focal length scope like this because you can attach a DSLR on the back, it's easy to focus, um, it's just a generally easy telescope. You have a nice wide field of view so you're not having trouble finding targets. Now most people do have a DSLR camera and they are great for imaging because you just remove the lens from the DSLR, put a small inexpensive attachment that allows you to couple the DSLR to a telescope. And then as for the mount itself, you can buy a mount called a Skywatcher HEQ5 which is the mount that I always recommend to people starting out. It's a smaller version of this equatorial mount used on a tripod. But the idea is you could attach a small refractor to that, you can attach a DSLR to the back, you can polar line that, it's got an inbuilt polar alignment scope, so you can get good polar alignment in about 10 minutes, if that. If you can use an auto guider, perhaps with a second guiding telescope, it's going to add a little bit to the cost, but the results will be really good. You're talking about a complete astrophotography rig for about £1,500. And that will last you for 10 years. You know, there's plenty of things in the sky that will photograph really well using a setup like that. At the end of a long night, literally, it's a five minute job. I can do all this from indoors. I just come out, set the computer indoors, and that's it, put the cover on. You just can't get in your pyjamas though, because you've got to come outside still. Oh, I'll just get to send the wife out, geezer. I mean, uh, that's not recording, is it, by the way? <laughs> no, I wouldn't do it. <laughs>